Hello. Hopefully you can hear and see me. Thanks for joining the Weave user group. And this is actually the last um, session for the Weave user group of this fall season. So we are very lucky to close it out with such great speakers. Uh, my name is Tomo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. So thanks for joining us. I see more and more people uh, joining us every second. So I'm glad to see a nice group here. So today we have Avi Fuller from AWS, who'll be giving us great updates from reInvent, which I'm sure some of you've heard about, uh, EKS and Fargate, there are a lot of things to come. So she'll uh, talk about that and answer your questions around that. Um, and then we also have Jason Smith from Container Solutions, who's kind of uh, a partner extension of the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. So he'll be talking about a related topic around AWS services and Weavescope around a project that we've often worked on together called um, SockShop, and that's a uh, open source microservices um, sample app that anybody can use, so you'll find out more about that if you haven't heard about SockShop. Before I advance, just a quick word from our sponsor. So this is the Weave uh, online user group. We also have Weave user groups in other cities where we have offices. Um, if you haven't heard of Weaveworks, uh, we are a company that brought to you RabbitMQ, hopefully technology that you've heard of. Our CTO, CEO, and some of the engineers are the people who brought you RabbitMQ. We're also Google Ventures and Excel Partners startup with offices um, headquartered in London, also in San Francisco, Berlin, and other places. Our main product is Weave Cloud, which is a SaaS product that helps you simplify the um, management, observability, deployments, and monitoring of your um, clusters. And our goal at Weaveworks around Weave Cloud is to lead you to one-click um, op um, operational um, and operational abilities, so that um, especially if you are an app developer, you can focus your time on developing your apps by leveraging our um, operational experience through Weave Cloud. And I will give you a quick 20 second uh, teaser of some of the cool things that you'll see in Weave Cloud. Um, as you can see here, observability is very important. Um, you can look into the architecture and topologies of your clusters from processes, containers, pods, and hosts. Um, and this is all in real time. You can see the connections between your pods. And also, especially when things go wrong, troubleshooting, you can look into your logs. And on the container level, you can actually access um, their CLI tool to make changes. Um, and there's much, much more, as I mentioned, around um, automated deployments and monitoring, but that's a quick teaser. Um, if you'd like to find out more, please come to weave.works and try out our product. And uh, if you have any questions, we have a Slack channel, so um, please join us there. So with that, as I mentioned, um, we have two great speakers today, Abby Fuller and Jason Smith. Um, so as Tamal said, I'm Abby Fuller. Uh, I work at AWS. I'm a technical evangelist, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that I am a software engineer that goes and talks to people a lot now. Um, so we just had to reinvent um, last, not last week, but the week before that, which is, I guess, kind of AWS Tech Christmas. So we do all of our, a lot of the big announcements for the year happen during the keynotes um, on Tuesday or Wednesday. So this year we had uh, a number of announcements that were that were relevant to, to kind of the container ecosystem, which is what I talk about most of the time. Um, as to Mal said, by the way, I'm happy to take questions the whole time. So we only have about 20 minutes for this for this segment. So questions as I'm going are fine. Uh, I'll, I'm also leaving time at the end to answer any questions that you've that you've saved. Um, but happy to happy to be stopped to answer questions as I go. So. I'm going to cover some of the announcements that we talked about a couple weeks ago that are kind of relevant to anyone working in the container space using AWS. Um, a couple big ones. Um, I think it's gotten to the point now where there's there's a lot of options for, for running workloads on, on AWS, right? So we started with, with kind of ECS, uh, but it's it's grown this year. So what does it look like now? So ECS, we've talked about for a while. Um, I think uh, in a lot of cases, Part of Jason's demo is, is running on ECS. Um, manage platform for any of your containers. Uh, the three kind of new announcements or two and a half new announcements that, that came out of reInvent this year are Amazon EKS, which is in preview right now. And I included a link at the end to sign up for it. Uh, and then we also announced something called Fargate mode. And that's for ECS available now. 
and then for EKS coming sometime in, in 2018. So I'm going to unpack some of these announcements, look at what they mean for you, talk about how you can use them in practice, uh, and then uh, as promised at the end, I will. I have a couple of links for people that are either looking to get started with them or looking to read more or looking to talk to someone about how they can use them. So I have some, some link goodness in the end for, for when the slides get posted. So breaking some of the options down, uh, Amazon ECS, I think people are in this audience are probably pretty familiar with it. So kind of our, our in-house managed solution uh, gets you integration with a bunch of other AWS services, so ALB or CloudFormation or IAM or Cloud Watch Logs. Uh, you can scale to support your cluster size. You can scale to support additional capacity. Uh, and then you get service integrations like ALB or NLB, and those are at the container level, which has been a shift over the last couple of years, I think, right? So when we started off, it was kind of EC2 plus a little bit of a container layer. And then where I've seen us kind of go in the last, the last two years here has been not just, don't manage it just at the EC2 level, but move everything down to the container level. So I think, so auto scaling is a really good example of that. So it started off where you could auto scale your underlying, your underlying hosts. So if I, if I run enough containers that I don't have the capacity left at the cluster level, how do I scale up? Uh, and then you've seen them, those, those be at kind of the service level as well. So for my messaging service, scale up when my queue length is above X messages. Or for my API service, scale up when my number of requests uh, is above a certain threshold. So you've seen a lot of things that used to be just at the EC2 level go, go down to the container level. So manage kind of your, your containers as like a first class citizen, right? So handle things like scaling and capacity and load balancing just at the container level, which lets you be a little bit more flexible because I can scale up. If I only have my messaging app gets a lot of traffic, but my internal admin app does not, um, I, can, I can handle everything more granularly through my container, which makes sense because if my application has been decomposed into, into these containers, it makes sense that I can treat the kind of the containers first with worrying less uh, about going to the EC2 level too. So I'll get back to that in a minute and why that's important. Um, but moving on for a second. So big announcement kind of number one. So we had ECS for a while and we've been kind of running containers for people on EC2 uh, from the very beginning. Um, but ECS was not really the, the only way that people were running containers in, in production on, on AWS, right? So I think, I forget the exact number, but the the Cloud Native Computing Foundation put out put out some numbers where I think over 60% of people were running their, their Kubernetes workloads on, on EC2, so on AWS. And what we were getting from a lot of people was, but I think this is a Monzo quote, and they're basically like, running highly available Kubernetes is not for the faint of heart. And I think that's really true. So the people that were able to put the time and effort and resources into running highly available Kubernetes have been really happy with it. So it's a great community. Uh, the third party API integration is great. Um, but being able to run, run it in a highly available fashion is, is although very much possible, it is also a lot of work. So we had, we had customers saying, but how can I run Kubernetes like ECS basically? How can I run Kubernetes in AWS, but have you manage some of the pieces for you for us? Um, so that's uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service, but for Kubernetes. So we're going to call it EKS because that's a really long, it's a really long name to call something. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's managed Kubernetes on AWS. Um, right now, it's bring your own cluster, um, managed Kubernetes control plane. plane uh, some help from the AWS side on making things highly available, uh, which I know is, is one of the headaches for, for Kubernetes. Uh, automated version upgrades, so you can opt in. Uh, you can opt into version upgrades. Uh, you can get minor upgrades through EKS. Uh, and then integration with, with other AWS services, so CloudTrail or CloudWatch or IAM. Um, and this is really similar. So we, we say, and I think in a lot of AWS presentations, just deep AWS integration. So a quick note on what, what we say when we, what we mean when we say that. And that's really that for things like load balancing or monitoring or uh, identity and access management, how can you, how can you get those things through, through other AWS services? So 
how can I, <clears throat> how can I use I am as a provider for identity? Or how can I use CloudTrail as a logs provider? And that's what I mean by what everyone, I guess, means by, by deep AWS integration. So how can I get those things, use the orchestration tool that I want, um, but also get some of the benefits of other AWS services? So the goal is to have deep AWS integration here as well. Um, you can sign up for the preview now. I included a link at the end. Um, you'll see... We'll come up with we'll come out with more announcements around this. I think as the year goes on, um, and then there's uh, some good intro presentations from Reinvent a couple weeks ago on EKS. Um, so I will share some links to those as well. Um, but you can see some demos of this and, and play around with it yourself if you if you sign up for the preview. But right now, bring your own cluster. Uh, you can basically import it into EKS, uh, and then you can use Kubi CTL um, to access your cluster like you would with regular Kubernetes. Um, I'd like to stress also that this is, this is managed Kubernetes, but it is also upstream Kubernetes. So it is not a uh, fancy, it is not, it is not a, a separate version. It is not a separate version of Kubernetes that we've done stuff to. This is the, this is the regular Kubernetes that you can use yourself, um, but we're helping you out um, a little bit. Um, question from chat, um, Sev Wetzel, uh, are you using Kubernetes service catalog for the integration with other AWS services? Um, I do not know the answer to that one off the top of my head. Um, I will look into it for you and I will, I will see if I can chase the right person on it. Um, I would assume, and this is not obviously a hundred percent, I could be wrong. But my assumption from talking at the EKS team so far is that since we're keeping everything as close to standard Kubernetes as possible, because that's what people are, that's what people want, um, we will use um, native Kubernetes features while possible. So I'm not 100% sure on service catalog, but uh, I do know that we're we're using kind of we're trying to keep it as close to to standard as possible. So I will I will check into that for you. Um, I think one more, one more announcement here to, to cover. So I think the, the theme here for a lot of people has been how, how can you run my containers for me? So containers are a lot of work, um, and it's, and it's good work, right? So you get a lot of benefit to using them. So, um, I can make my infrastructure more flexible. I can maybe handle more traffic while using less resources. So there's a, there's a lot of options here. And then it can be a lot of work to manage these. So not only in a highly available way, but just a lot of work in general. So you have to make sure that your, that your container has the right resources, but you also need to make sure that your underlying cluster has the right resources. You need to manage security groups. You need to manage load balancers. Um, there's a lot of pieces that go into this. And so you started off with kind of just regular containers on EC2, and then people said, so how can you run these for me? Then we had ECS. And then people are like, okay, well, sometimes I want to use Kubernetes too. So we have EK, and so they started using Kubernetes on, on EC2. And then you had people say, but I want to use Kubernetes and have that managed as well. So then you had EKS. And then you've still had kind of customers for a while saying, how can I do none of that? I only want to care about my containers. I don't really want to care about the underlying cluster infrastructure. And I think a really nice way of putting it that I've heard a couple of times is, why should I have to manage infrastructure to manage infrastructure? Um, which brings us to Fargate. So Fargate is an underlying technology for container management. So no cluster or infrastructure to manage or scale anymore. Handle everything at the container level. You can scale seamlessly in response to demand. Um, so you'll be able to use Fargate kind of two different ways. Um, ultimately, it means you don't worry about a lot of the pieces that kind of make up the heavy lifting of containers. So scaling or service mesh or service mesh or underlying infrastructure or cluster resources or capacity. Um, you don't do anything with the underlying EC2 instances uh, that make up your, your cluster. You just care about the containers. So it's in preview for ECS right now. Uh, we'll come for EKS sometime in 2018. But right now for, for ECS, I just give it a task definition. Um, I give my container itself some resource limits and then away I go. And then I, I, I just deploy that. So 
all you're really focused on is the unit that makes up that container. So that task definition or, or that pod. Um, I just focus on that. I focus on getting that out. And then I don't worry about the setup or the resources for the underlying, uh, the underlying cluster at all. Um, how does that work in, in practice for you? So you'll end up with two different launch types for ECS and EKS. So uh, this is a screenshot that I took of my console right before I got on the phone. Um, I basically, when I go to launch something new, I'll have two separate ways to do that. I can either launch it with my with launch type EC2, so that's my traditional one. I manage all my cluster infrastructure, or I can use the launch type of Fargate. So Fargate is what we just talked about. So how I, I launch it, and then uh, by using the launch type of Fargate, I no longer have to manage my cluster infrastructure. Um, Thomas Vaughn says, is Fargate sort of like a V2 of ECS? Is it essentially competing with EKS in the long term, where Fargate is Amazon's answer to, to Kubernetes? Um, so it's an interesting question. I don't really, is Fargate sort of a V2 of ECS? Um, possibly, but, but not really. So I think, so I think the first thing to look at here is that Fargate in itself is, is not an actual service. So it, it's, not a, it's not a service by itself. It's, an, it's like an underlying technology. So if I launch something in Fargate mode, it's like an extra step of managed. So when I'm deploying something or scaling something or working with something, um, I don't necessarily, I stop worrying about the underlying cluster resources and focus just on the container. So it's a step to letting me focus on a different unit of work, right? So that I focus, if I want to run containers, I only care about the containers and I care less about the EC2 instances that are running underneath those containers. So that's what Fargate is. So not sure it's necessarily a V2 of ECS. It's more like a different launch type that I can use with ECS. Um, so the second question here was, is, is it essentially competing with EKS in the long term where Fargate is Amazon's answer to Kubernetes? Uh, the answer to that is no. So there'll be a Fargate mode for EKS also, and it will function in practice the same way as Fargate mode for ECS, which is, you can use ECS or you can use Kubernetes. Uh, and beyond that, if I want to use Kubernetes or ECS and not manage the underlying infrastructure, I can run my ECS or EKS containers in Fargate mode. So um, hopefully that answers your question and I see your response um, that yes, it does. Um, awesome. Glad to hear that. A uh, follow-up question from Derek Carisu. Uh, how does Fargate handle EC2 maintenance for long-running containers? Zero downtime, question um, mark. So the answer for, for how Fargate handles the, the EC2 maintenance. So with, with Fargate, you're not handling EC2 maintenance at all. Full stop. You, don't, you have nothing to do with the, with the underlying EC2 containers. You don't you don't, uh, you don't configure that infrastructure, you don't run things in the EC2 user data at instance boot, um, you, have, you have no access to it and you have no control over it. You only care about your containers and ECS and Fargate will handle, will handle placing those for you. Um, zero downtime for container deployments, it'll function just like ECS. So you deploy it, the health check runs for your container. Uh, if health checks passes, pass, it will, roll a little connection drain and then roll your connections out your will roll your traffic over to the to the new version um so that's how it handles it for long running containers fargate will handle will will handle that stuff exactly like ecs does so zero time nine de deployments uh long running containers will function the same way you're just not the one configuring the underlying infrastructure you're only worrying about your task definition or container definition it's that's the only thing that you configure. You just don't configure the underlying EC2 infrastructure. Um, so hopefully that answers that, but it functions exactly the same. Just the bonus point is don't configure the underlying infrastructure yourself. Um, the side effect here though is if you are handling things, so when I ran ECS in production, I was doing some things on the EC2 instance. So like running a, running a daemon, um, stuff like that. Um, 
if you're doing things like that, so handling things through the EC2 user data or something like that, uh, then Fargate is perhaps not the right choice for you right now because you won't have that control over your EC2 instances the way that you do in ECS or EKS. Um, Second question from Raju Supana, uh, is Fargate elastic? Can I change the resource allocations on the fly? Um, you can change them the same way that you will on, on ECS. So uh, you change it in your task definition and then you redeploy. So uh, as long as you're talking about the resource allocation for the actual container, then yes, I mean, on the fly, meaning you change your you change your task definition, you redeploy. If you're looking to do that without redeploying your task definition, the answer is no. If you're looking for the same behavior as ECS, where you change it in the task definition or container definition and then redeploy, then the answer is yes. Um, does Fargate handle? Oh, so from from Moses Merchant, does Fargate handle shared storage? Um, if you're sharing actual volumes. Um, I believe you'll still be able to manage the volumes at the task definition level the way that you do now, but I am not 100% sure on how shared storage will work. If you have a volume that's part of your container, I'm going to assume that you're able to handle it the same way. Um, if you were doing it a different way through mounting things to the EC2 instance your, itself, I'm going to say no. Um, from Arun Sriam, um, will Fargate take advantage of spot instance pricing if we don't see EC2 instances in that mode? Um, my understanding is that EC is, is that Fargate is not going to do spot instance pricing um, in the preview. I'm not 100% sure what the what the roadmap is for that, but if that's something that you're interested in in seeing, definitely. Uh, you can ping me. Uh, you can either send me a message on Twitter. It's at Abby Fuller, or you can email me. It's um, it's Abby Full at Amazon.com or at Abby Fuller. Um, so if you have any suggestions that that you need me, that you want me to look into, or that you want me to to pass on to the team, you can either email me or send me a, a DM on on Twitter. Um, let's see what questions I'm at. How Fargate is able, from Bogdan Alessu, how is Fargate able to handle service discovery among containers? Uh, all the tasks between the same containers need to discuss between each other or be in HA, run on, on different EC2 instances. Um, so assuming I understand this, this question correctly, um, Fargate will handle, will ha handle EC, will handle service discovery, sorry, it's hard to talk, uh, the same way as, as ECS does. So uh, I can either talk to my, I can talk to resources that are in the same BPC. So I'm gonna assume that Fargate will handle that the same way, assuming that I'm actually answering this correctly, but your tasks for the same container that need to speak to each other will still be able to, to speak to each other. Um, from Nikolai and Estev, will there be VPC support for Fargate? Uh, yes. Uh, there is VPC support for Fargate. Um, from Rashu Zubana, do we know or have access to the server on which it's provisioned? Uh, no, you don't have access to the server on which it's provisioned for Fargate. So the the <clears throat> the side effect of, of a managed service, right, is that someone else is managing it for you, but you don't necessarily have access to it. Um, if you need, again, if you need access to the underlying EC2 uh, unit, uh, Fargate is maybe not the right choice for you right now. So if you're configuring things yourself on your host, um, you, you don't, Fargate won't allow you to do that. You just have access to your containers, which makes it a lot easier to work with, but also you have a little less control over, over the host yourself, the hosts themselves. Sorry. Um, I think I've caught, I think I've caught all of the all of the questions in the chat. If I've missed your, if I've missed your chat question, um, send it again. Um, for those of you that had, that had feature questions that I wasn't sure of, um, I will follow up on them. Um, you are always welcome to email me. That's my email address and my Twitter handle. Um, pass it on. If you have, if you've played, so you can use Fargate mode for ECS right now. Um, so you should you can reach out to, to anyone on the team to talk about it 
um, if you're using it also. Um, if you, um, so you can, you can use it right now. Um, and then the same as with the same as with any AWS service, um, if you're looking for a feature and we don't support it, um, a lot of our roadmap is, is driven by customer suggestions. So, uh, definitely let your account manager know, uh, or let your technical account manager know, um, they love to hear that stuff and, and we love to hear that stuff from you. So send them to me, send them to your account manager, um, let us know on GitHub. Um, from Raju again on persistent storage, um, I believe that volumes will be handled the same way that they are on ECS. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. Uh, I generally don't do, I don't handle things like persistent storage or, or state at the container level. I tend to handle them uh, in a cache or a database. So perhaps I'm not the right person to ask. I think I might be a little biased. Um, but I believe volumes will be handled the same way. Um, and then I will look and see if there's anything, anything else in persistent storage. Um, I do know that um, Arun from the AWS open source team has written at least one blog post on running stateful containers. Um, so that might be a, a good place to look if you're looking for a different perspective. But I will, I will look into Fargate and, and, and persistent storage for everyone. Um, so that is all I have. Um, I've, and I'm just about at the end of my, of my time here. Um, I've included a couple of links here at the end. Um, so there's the link on how to join the EKS preview. Um, there's some links to both the Fargate and the EKS uh, blog posts. Um, and then there's a, a post from Liz Rice from Aqua Security, who's awesome, um, who tried out Fargate with a project. Um, and then I included some links for some pe other people at AWS that have been talking about this stuff. Um, so Nathan Peck is one of the um, is one of the developer advocates on the ECS on the containers team at AWS. Uh, so he wrote a Medium post, but um, he's also super available on, on Twitter and, and email to, to answer your questions. So he's a great person to, to connect with if you're looking to, to have another conversation about, about Fargate or EKS or ECS. Um, and then I included a link to the, the slide share from the Container State of the Union that was given by Deepak Singh at reInvent this year. So he's the, the GM for containers here at AWS. Um, so he talked a lot about kind of where containers are at Amazon right now, what we're doing, what we're working on, um, all that good stuff. So a couple of different links for you. Uh, and then if you're looking to try Fargate, since that's where a lot of the questions have come from today, um, if you go to your ECS console, so um, if, you, if you go there, um, there's, if you go to an existing cluster or just a console itself, there's a blue flag at the top right now um, that lets you uh, get started with Fargate and, and walks you through the, the first run experience for Fargate. So, so I've tested out Fargate myself a couple times now, and although I am not a, a new user to ECS, I very strongly recommend uh, looking at the first run experience for Fargate if you're looking to get started. Um, they've spent a lot of time on making the, the first run experience very streamlined. Um, and I had a bit of a hard time when I didn't do the first run experience, uh, even though I'm not a new user. Uh, so very strongly recommend that you, that you start with the first run experience on this one, even if you're an ECS expert. Um, but uh, follow that flag. Um, it's only in US East 1 right now. Um, so if you don't see the flag, uh, go to the, to the US East 1 region. Um, and then check that out. And then I will, oh, one more question. Uh, do I know that if Fargate, we, you, uh, if on Fargate, you can attach ENIs for each task without limitation? On ECS, you are limited to the max ENIs that EC2 instance can support. Um, I believe it is the same behavior as ECS right now, but I will check and see if perhaps I'm wrong. But right now I believe it is working the same as ECS. Um, but I will, I will look into it. Um, if I find any answers to these, by the way, um, I will, I will let Tamal know, um, so that she can, she can let the user group know. And then I also, I guess I tweet everything anyway also. So, um, 
I will, I will tweet the answers to the questions as I, as I come up to them again. Um, so thank you for all your questions. Um, definitely feel free to, to email me or send me a, a tweet uh, if you have more questions. And with that, I will turn it back over to, to Mao and, and next Jason. Yes. So actually, yeah, you get a little bit extra time. The first speaker, it, you don't have to be so rushed. Um, so if there are a few more questions, that's fine. And actually, I had a question. So it seems sort of one overarching theme is um, if you get or opt for sort of these, these managed layers, a sacrifice is you give up control, right? So are there any particular special accounts where um, they just need certain types of configs or they need things set up in a certain way that you do get to have options, even if maybe you don't go and make those changes yourself? If, I don't know, you're some big enterprise company and you're like, well, we just need to make sure that our, our levels are set in a certain way. Um, I'm not that experienced in this area, so I'm curious if those are options ever. So I think two things to point out here. So the first is that just, just because you're not managing it doesn't mean that somebody's not managing it. So like the security is treated exactly the same way as it would be for anything else. So all it's doing is that it's moving, it's removing kind of the work that you have to do to configure it yourself. And that I think one of the pain points for people has been, has been scaling. So why should I have to scale my underlying infrastructure to just run more containers? Why can't you do that for me? And I think that's was a big plus for me with Fargate is that I don't have to do the, the underlying cluster resource scaling. Um, as to configuring things, I think one thing that I haven't pointed out is that I can run, and you could see it in my, oops, you could see it in my screenshot. Um, across my cluster, I can run kind of, I can run, I can run in both in both modes. So I can run some services as, as part of Fargate and then some services as my launch type EC2. So I can run that cluster hybrid. So theoretically I could run the services that I didn't have any configuration to do as part of Fargate and let AWS handle it. And I feel like what Fargate feels like to me is kind of the Lambda Dynamo DB version of doing things. So you get the same behavior as you would from using something else, but someone else is worrying about how you can provision capacity. And by someone else worrying about it, I mean you're just not worrying about it. Um, it's just happening behind the scenes. So that's what it feels like to me. But if I am looking for more control, I can run things in the EC2 launch type, or I can run them as both. So I can run some services as part of Fargate and some services as part of EC2 and then run them on the same cluster. Um, as to configuring things, uh, just a little bit for Fargate. I believe that the answer to that right now is no. If I just want some values changed or if I need some tasks to run on a certain kind of service, um, the answer to that is to use ECS or EKS. Um, uh, Raju in the chat says, is Fargate similar to Lambda as you pay per computing second use without having to worry about the EC2 instances? Um, I will send a link as soon as I leave full screen, because I'm trapped right now, um, to the Fargate pricing, but your Fargate is closer to ECS and that you're paying for the underlying compute infrastructure, you're not paying for Fargate itself. Um, so the pricing model is, is like ECS. Um, Sebastian Yandon says, if I'm just getting started, would you recommend starting with ECS before moving to Fargate? Um, great question. Not necessarily. Um, I think it's, so he, I get this question a lot, is whether, do I use ECS, do I use Fargate, do I use EKS, do I use Fargate for ECS, do I use Fargate for EKS? And the, the long answer is that choices, choices are good because it lets people use what works for their work, for their, for their actual workload. And for those of you that are tired of saying, it, listening to me say, but it depends on your workload, it's true for a reason. So just because something works for Tamao doesn't mean that it works for me. So she might have a lot of Kubernetes experience, so she wants to use EKS because she's happy with it. And I know that I used ECS originally when I was doing kind of the switch over to containers because I there was only one of me and I didn't have a lot of Kubernetes experience. So I wanted what felt the most familiar to me and ECS felt the most Amazon-y to me. So it really does depend on both you as a team and then your actual workload. What I think people should be focusing on is 
what will enable me to deliver the best experience to my customers? And there's no, there's no wrong answer there. But if you're unexperienced with, with Kubernetes, then you might have a more of a hard time getting highly available Kubernetes, which means that you might have some struggles getting a good experience to your customers. If you do the research and you can put the work into running it, then sure. It has a great community. It has great third-party API support. There are, are pros to all of them. As for ECS before Fargate, it's, again, more of a question of your workload and not your experience. So I think that if I hadn't used ECS first, then Fargate would have been easier for me to start with because it took away a level that I, didn't, that I don't need to do. So I could have just written my task definition and then done nothing about worrying about the ECS agent or whether I had picked the right kind of instances for my cluster. It just kind of took away a level for me. Um, what made it more difficult to use Fargate having used ECS before is that um, I've historically done some customization at the EC2 level and that's not necessarily right anymore. If I don't have to do anything at the EC2 level, I would recommend using Fargate um, because it takes away something that I previously had to manage. Uh, if you do need to do something at the EC2 level, you need to stick with ECS. And there's not really a wrong, there's not a wrong answer here. Uh, but if you've never used ECS before, no problems with moving to Fargate. Um, I think you actually might have an, Getting started with Fargate might actually be easier if you didn't go to ECS first because you would it be like starting with Lambda instead of moving to Lambda that you get used to doing all of your configuration at the container level. And I think in the last couple, the last year, I've seen ECS and now knowing about Fargate, I've seen ECS support more of the things that I previously needed access to the EC2 instance to control. So, uh, Demons are a really good example of this. So if I wanted to run like a new relic agent before, I had to do that on the host. Um, but you've seen a lot of support recently for things like one per host to run things like loggers or demons and agents and stuff like that. So that was my biggest use case for needing to have access to the EC2 instance before. So had this been available to me, I might have started with Fargate. Um, but... It, it definitely depends on what you're trying to do. And remember that you can use both. So if you, if you start off with Fargate and you, you find, oh, well, now I feel like I needed to do something to my underlying EC2 instance, you can run that service with EC2 launch type rather than a Fargate launch type. So that was a, that was a really long answer. The short answer is not necessarily. And then please see the long answer. So hopefully that actually answers your question though. Thanks so much. So um, I guess with that, is there going to be an EKS uh, like Slack channel or places where maybe people who are new to Kubernetes but want to use it um, with these new options can talk and share ideas? That's a great question. Um, the, I believe that there is a Slack channel for AWS that people can go to talk about containers um, I don't know if I'm in the Slack channel or I don't know if I know anything. Um, so I know that we have that. I know that it has not been, it has not been super open in the past. Cause I think we kind of started off with a small group to, to see what happened. Um, so I'll pass around the link and my distraction is because I'm looking for the link for you right now. Um, but I would hope, and this is a this is a hopeful statement right now, and I will look into how factual it is. Um, my hope would be that the same way that we the same containers kind of community on the Slack that supported ECS would also support EKS. Um, so a good person for me to ask about this though is I'm not sure if anyone is is based in in New York or if it has met Nathan before, but there are actually a number of containers developer advocates that do a lot of like, community building and question answering and talking back and forth and support and stuff like that. So it's Nathan Peck, it's Brent Langston, and it's Tiffany Jernigan. And all three of them are very open about answering questions and stuff. Um, I believe that you can go to the Slack channel. If you can't, 
Um, I'm sure that there is some sort of interest email that you can do to reach the team. And I will look into that and I will send it to Tamao to send out to the user group. Okay. Uh, or awesome. ask us on Twitter. Cause I, I would say that people are generally very chatty on Twitter for some reason. So, so Scott, Scott just added a link here. So yeah, I was going to mention, so we can move on to Jason. If there's any links that you want to put in the chat room while Jason's talking, um, maybe that's a good way to do it. I'm going to look for them. But if you had a question that I didn't have the answer to, I will go back and I will find someone else on the ECS or EKS teams. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll add links to the chats. So I, I think awesome. I owe you Fargate pricing. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think you'll stick around. You'll be in the chat room a little bit. Um, we'll switch to Jason. Hi guys. Hi, uh, I'm Jason Smith. I work for a company called Container Solutions. Uh, I, I am still waiting for my uh, EKS preview to be approved. Well, our whole company is. Um, uh, so what I'm going to demo real quick is just how uh, Weave Scope works with the uh, with some AWS services. What I'm demoing is based off of the Sock Shop. I saw somebody who was asking about a link for the Sock Shop. It is under the uh, GitHub microservices demo, microservice demo. It's about uh, two years old now, I think. Uh, they, it was originally developed for Weave, I think, to, to just demo scope in practice and just show how it works. And then it kind of blew up into something way bigger. So if you delve into it and you go to the deploys, you can actually see that we've developed uh, it, container solutions with Weave have developed all these different deployments, um, all using the same service. So we have ECS, Kubernetes, Swarm, um, MesOS, MesOS Marathon, um, Mini MesOS, all these other different uh, deployments, all using the same uh, microservices that we developed. And it's basically uh, providing um, uh, just a demo uh, shopping site for socks, where you can just buy socks. Of course, it's uh, not a real site, but uh, you won't get any socks delivered to your house. But it is a great site to do demos of how the services work. And if you look at um, all the different services that are involved with it, we have like users, catalogs, uh, front end, carts, queues, shipping, all these other different services that are interacting with each other. And it's a great way to test uh, your infrastructure. A lot of times we use this um, at Container Solutions, we use it constantly for, uh, for training. Training purposes, it's great. Uh, it's a great way to see if your net, your CNI plugins are working. It's a great way to see if your deployment, if your Kubernetes cluster is working correctly. So, um, but we did have some special uh, setups for AWS with this because um, with AWS, you can take advantage of some cloud services that aren't going to be containerized. So normally, uh, if you look at the... Uh, if you look at the sock shop, and this is the uh, staging sock shop website, which socks.weave.works, which should be, uh, in theory, constantly up if you ever want to go visit it, socks.weave.works. Uh, this is the site, and you can see we have a catalog and an orders DB service. What we did with the, um, with the microservice demo it, for ECS is we replaced those with DynamoDB and uh, um, uh, RDS. So we took out the catalog DB and we replaced it with RDS and we replaced the uh, orders DB with uh, DynamoDB. So what we have now is you can see that uh, you're not going to see an order right now and I'm going to demo how an order works. What you see is we have um, all the catalog services are now talking to an RDS database versus before they were talking to, and you'll see the connections pop up every once in a while here. Uh, normally, which you're talking to the catalog DB microservice. Uh, going back to uh, what we said earlier, what Abby said earlier, uh, we're big advocates also of storing all your state somewhere else. Uh, so, and if you're going to run a DB, uh, it'd be preferable if it was a hosted service versus uh, putting it in your Kubernetes cluster. Anyway, um, so this is the actual, uh, I just launched the ECS demo. I would have done it for you guys live, but that would, we'd be sitting here for most of Abby's talk. Actually, I probably could have launched it before she started talking, we'd still be waiting. Um, but, uh, so I launched it ahead of time, and this is the, this is the sock shop right there, and this is the same sock shop that, uh, that uh, Weave is running in a Kubernetes cluster somewhere else. 
same exact service, uh, same exact uh, containers, and you can see in a different orchestration platform, it all works the same anyway. So uh, I'm just going to demo real quick how, uh, or just show how the uh, connections show up for uh, the order service. If you want to log in, we do have logins. The easiest one to remember is user password. And we'll hit login. All right. And let's order the, okay, can't order anything over $100 or it's going to reject your credit card. That was just an idea to demonstrate how it works. So we'll add that to the cart. When items in the cart, proceed to checkout. And if we go, oh God, go away. If we go here, we should see, yeah, there it is. DynamoDB was hit by the orders DB service. So basically we developed all these, um, uh, we developed these services just to show how um, we've had incorporated uh, AWS services into scope. So you can actually see the track that's going over the wire with your, um, with your microservices, even if you're using a provided service uh, like AWS. Uh, is there any questions? Or did I go too fast? I'm curious. Um, this, we've had this long history of building this. I'm hearing a little. Uh, are there any best practices aside from as what you mentioned? You know, how you want to deal with your data, how to store it. Are there any other things that? If someone's new to using Kubernetes? Well, um, I think uh, one of the biggest ones is for uh, us as a consultancy is always uh, you have to uh, develop your CI CD pipelines. Uh, because when you go from one monolith that you can deploy manually easily to 100 uh, different services that you need to deploy, you don't want to do those. The, the act of manually deploying then becomes a nightmare. So uh, you need to start working on your pipelines so they're, they're quickly deploying and you're constantly pushing out your, uh, your changes. In addition to that, if this, this is a microservices demo, is there some kind of basic microservices philosophies that uh, if someone's brand new to microservices, they should keep in mind? Top three things. What do you mean? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was going to mention too, to that point, actually, um, and uh, you kind of led me into a sales pitch for Weave here. You guys do have Flux. <laughs> you guys do offer Flux, which is part of you know a continuous delivery pipeline as well. Uh, so philosophy, um, you know, we try to stick loosely to the twelve factor app if we can. Um, uh, we try not to store state in our in our containers if we ever can try to use object storage or something else. Um, you know, you can bootstrap a node from S3 versus uh, trying to keep it on a, a, a volume somewhere. It's much easier. Um, and, 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 the, and, and the continuous pipelines are the big ones, so. Yeah, we had a comment. Someone said, single responsibility objects. Single responsibility objects, yes. Um, yes, <clears throat> so I, I you're referring to the idea that uh, they, the domain of the object itself, correct? Yes, exactly, right. Catalog orders. Right. Yeah, that was, uh, I think that was, it was uh, sort of the buzzword that came around when Kubernetes started hitting the scene too, is uh, uh, the single domain of an of a object that's gonna, of a microservice. And since you have, uh, useful experience as a consultant, when you've helped people with these types of environments or needs, are there any other things that you've encountered, maybe missteps or um, new ways that they need to think that could lead you to some good advice to share? Well, I think that's the biggest issue that we have run across is um, it's the new way to think. Um, a lot of people, they're like microservices is hot. And then we'll go in and, and advise a company and they'll be like, okay, yeah, I want to do microservices. And then we say, okay, well, your culture has to change. The way you're working is going to have to change. The way you're, um, that your teams um, react to each other is going to change. Um, and, and, and the way your operations is going to change. Uh, there's a lot of like barriers. Uh, there's a lot of um, 
ops and developer barriers that are going on that need to be torn down. Um, delivery pipelines need to be streamlined. And, and, and the actual culture of how the teams are working together needs to be changed. And that's usually way more challenging than deploying a Kubernetes cluster. Because we can get people and we can, we can educate them on how to deploy Kubernetes or, no, uh, or um, a DCOS or on ECS or something like that. That's not the hard part. The hard part is getting the culture change where they can actually effectively take advantage of this. Do you guys at Container Solutions help a little with that? Yeah, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you really go in and help with the culture change as well. Yeah, that's usually the biggest, that's usually, um, the biggest area where we help people at. I mean, it does help that we have people like Michael Mueller and, um, you know, some of these other uh, people that are pretty big in the Kubernetes scene and, you know, we're, we're kind of DCOS partners and we just became AWS partners. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and we're working with Microsoft and Google and stuff like that really close. So, yeah, I mean, it helps with the technological aspects of it, but when it comes down to it, um, uh, it it's... It's more of a, a, a procedural cultural change within the company that usually ends up being where we spend a lot of time. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to Abby uh, for your presentations. Thanks, everybody, for your active questions. Thank you. Um, so thanks again for joining the Weave Online User Group. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have a Slack channel. If there's any questions that you'd like to follow up with, um, we ourselves here at WeaveWorks have tons of um, expertise in various areas. We ourselves run Weave Cloud uh, on Kubernetes on AWS, so we are a use case, and uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges that we've gone through to get to where we are, so there's a lot that we know. So if you have any questions for us, our developer experience team is here to help you. Uh, if, if this is the first time you've joined the Weave user group, please join us on Meetup. As I've mentioned, we're online, but we also have um, sometimes meetups in particular cities, so please check us out and find the cities if you want to join us in person. Uh, again, so thank you, Abby, and thank you, Jason, for coming. And uh, we will be posting our spring schedule for the U Weave user group uh, within this month. So we look forward to seeing you all in the spring. Thanks again. Bye-bye.